Dear students, let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is the 2nd May 2016. The first article is related to the MG Narega. There are series of articles which are coming on MG Narega. This is the ninth article which I am discussing within a span of one month. And World Bank also has given a very positive review for MG Narega. And the government has extended the scope of MG Narega from 100 days to 150 days in the drought prone areas. And it is 10th year of uh, MG Narega. So in this context we can expect a very good question on MG Narega this year. So let us try to discuss this from the perspective of this article. Understand, MG Narega is one of uh, uh, a job employment or employment guarantee programs which is based on rights based approach. The second thing is, during the drought, MG Narega is the major lifeline for the rural people. And added to that, the other is Food Security Act. So in this context, the Bharatwada region is facing an unprecedented drought. The Bead Jalna districts or Jalna regions of the Marathwada, they are having the highest drought in water scarcity. So generally we expect that the MG Narega disbursements will be high in these districts. But if we compare over here, the average days of work is around 47 days for these districts. And the number of people who benefited from MG Narega, they stand around 70,000. Then where the challenge is? Now carefully observe, the financial pattern under MG Narega is this. The central government has to transfer the funds, 100% of the funds, uh, for manual work, unskilled manual labor. So in this context, um, this, if it is a rights-based approach, um, as the number of people who are asking for the work under the program increases, uh, the center shall be disbursing more funds. Uh, but however, there is delay in the payment of the funds for more than 15 days. The law allows for the 15 days for disbursement of funds. The time has crossed even two months in certain areas. So weak fund dispersal from the central government is the major challenge. And the second is, if you go to the former distress, understand that the cattle is the last savior for the farmer. So the rural indebtedness is increasing because of the lack of returns from the various plantations taken up by the farmers in this region. So, the, for the distressed sale of the cattle is what the farmer is resorting to because he has no money to feed them. So, government provides for cattle shelters during the drought season. But if you observe the cattle shelters in Marathwada region, these are not operated by the government but by the cooperatives. Even to these cattle shelters, the government is not dispersing the money in time. Now, coming to the water politics. Here the author covered about uh, the breweries uh, which are uh, taking a huge uh, water consumption for production of the beer in Marathwada region. But on the other side, you all know that uh, sugarcane crop uh, which is irrigated through flooding of water is also a major uh, reason for uh, a drought over here. So the sugar cooperatives, they enjoy the huge political uh, support. And added to that, the recently IPL controversy has also come up in uh, relation to the drought over here. So it means rather than the drinking water and farmers' needs, uh, more than that, uh, the commercial needs are gaining the importance in this region. So here, other articles, what they say about this condition is, uh, uh, we need to educate the farmers about the water conservation, especially the sugarcane crop. So the drip irrigation can be an alternative solution. So water shall be made as a paid commodity, then automatically farmers also uh, becomes very cautious in using or conserving the water. So that is one thing which was suggested in previous articles. Now coming to the self-reliance is the key. It is about uh, IRNSS. You know that seven satellite constellation was kept in uh, uh, geostationary and uh, uh, the uh, orbit and geosynchronous orbit. These are India's GPS, which is going to cover 1500 kilometers surrounding India. It means many of the neighborhood countries also can get from the NAVIC, the name for India's regional navigation satellite system. 
So in this, uh, the precision is 20 meters um, and it also provides for the real-time usage. So there are two ways of usage in this. One is uh, the standardized model and the other one is restricted model. The restricted will be used for the military purposes. Uh, and the major drawback of this is um, you have this um, or else you don't have the backup satellite uh, in the case of a technical snag. So India is also planning for this backup satellite at a later date. On the other hand, the America's GPS, uh, the Galileo of European Union, GLONASS of Russia, they have the presence throughout the world. So they have a global presence. But uh, India's Navic and Chinese Beidou, they don't have the global presence. For example, if I want to fire beyond the 1500 kilometers range, the IRNSS may not be useful for us. So these are the various challenges still have to be addressed with regard to IRNSS. Now coming to India's taxpayers. So you know that uh, yesterday for the first time the government has released the tax data. So from 1960s and which the government stopped releasing the tax data. And Thomas Piketty, when he has visited India, he has clearly stated uh, without tax data and understanding of um, the tax issues, especially the growth of inequalities and wealth, uh, cannot be understood properly in the society. So here, um, uh, if we observe the tax data, only 4% of the Indians are actually paying the, filing the tax returns. Um, among that, half of the people are only paying the taxes. So with regard to the wealth proportion India has, the amount of the tax paid is very less. So what the government is resorting to, it is more and more increasing the indirect taxes and the tax rates. As indirect taxes increase, it is going to hurt the bank loan or bank savings and it is also going to hurt the poor people the worst. We know that indirect taxes are applied equally among the rich and poor, but the direct taxes only affects the rich. So in this case, we have to take certain steps in reforming the direct taxes and bring a, curtail the tax evasion. For this, what we can do is the large farms, agricultural incomes from the large farms can be brought under the income tax. And added to that, we can broaden the information data bank of the income tax department to identify the tax evaders. So this can be the solution. Now coming to the National Court of Appeal. So already we have discussed enough on this. So here the major reasons to have the National Court of Appeal is the Supreme Court is getting overburdened with the routine mill of the work, a run of the mill of the work. So if it has to concentrate on substantial questions of law, the constitutional aspects, it needs its merit and free time. For that purpose, the appeals have to be transferred to another court that is the, the National Court of Appeal with regional benches that can be established throughout the country. But the government is opposing to this, saying that um, it will add another uh, level in the court hierarchy in India without providing any substantial benefits. Uh. So in this case, um, the Supreme Court uh, work has to become qualitative. Then if the constitutional benches have to be regularly attended, uh, then what we need is the National Court of Appeal. The second is access to justice. The Supreme Court in the form of the appeals is mostly accessed by the uh, people, the uh, people from the North India, the High Court of Delhi gets the, sends the highest co appeals to the Supreme Court, uh, followed by Uttarakhand, uh, followed by UP. It means that um, the Northern states are more using the uh, Supreme Court through appeal. So the least uh, number of cases comes from the Madras High Court. So it means there is a spatial uh, difference with regard to the appeals. So if it has to provide for the equal access to the appeals, then the regional benches need to be appointed so the National Court of Appeal can help for these regional benches. This is what has been spoken by the author. Now coming to Indian Express. So the Bhagat Singh, he has been described as revolutionary terrorist by Bipin Chandra's India's Struggle for Independence. We all know this book. We will be reading it as a standard book for our modern India. Now the revolutionary terrorist, in what context it was used, is entirely different from the meaning of the terrorist we use it for today. 
So Bipin Chandra, he himself has clarified that um, the word revolutionary terrorist is to differentiate uh, the work of the Bhagat Singh from the mainline movement uh, which is carried forward by the Gandhiji at that point of time. So it is not to derogate uh, but it is to differentiate. Now the Bipin Chandra's work, uh, it, were, it has brought in uh, the heroism and the valor of uh, uh, Bhagat Singh. So in this context, um, uh, the Bipin Chandra in his book him, uh, described these as heroic acts. Um, these people have dependent on personal heroic acts to fight the Raj of the days. Now, in India, if you observe the revolutionary terrorism, it happened in two phases. The phase one, which is uh, after the Vande Matra movement, um, and the phase two after the uh, suspension of the non-cooperation movement by Gandhiji. The phase one is mostly religious elements were strong in that, but phase two is highly secular. And phase one was confined to Bengal, and phase two was, conf I mean, it is major focal point was Punjab, and most of the North India too. And phase one, uh, majorly by the, uh, I mean, uh, educated uh, Bengalis, um, and added to that, it has no socialistic direction. So it is just to take down the Raj, but it has no political economic direction. The phase two has clearly said that the Marxist line of mass movement is necessary to fight the British Raj, and its goal is also stated as socialism. So the Hindustan Republican Association was changed to Hindustan Socialistic Republican Association. So these are the differences between phase one and phase two. So here. The finally, in an introduction to uh, the Bhagat Singh's Why I Am an Atheist, uh, Bipin Chandra has clearly called him as revolutionary socialist uh, rather than a terrorist. So this is what we need to understand from this. Next is why growth in bank deposits is uh, at 53 year low in India. So now, understand these things. The inflation is low. And then the bank rates are relatively high when compared to inflation. Inflation is around 4.5%, bank rates are around 7%. So it means the net return to the uh, depositor will be high in this phase. But if you take the last year, last before year, the inflation was around 10% and bank rates were around 7 to 8%. The net return was actually negative. So when compared to last year, this year, the bank deposits are coming down. What might be the reason? The first is, um, the cash transactions are increasing in India. Why? One is, whenever there are elections, um, so huge expenditure involves and everyone tries to keep their cash secured to electoral purposes. The second thing is, the service tax rate has increased. So if I take the formal banking institutional structures, I am bound to pay the service tax. So as tax rates are increasing, it has become disincentive for the people to use the formal banking structures for that matter. And finally, the incomes of the people also have decreased. Incomes decrease lead to automatically low savings rate. If you see the rural side of India, so there is a lot of distress due to drought or the other seasons, other reasons. Now if you come to urban India too, now uh, last quarter, uh, I mean Labor um, Bureau of Labor report, uh, if you observe, the employment growth rate um, has decreased in the key industries. Uh, so last year it was around 4 lakhs, it has come down to 1 lakh. So a jobless growth scenario is also a reason for a weak demand in this particular area. So all these things are decreasing the income and then leading to the low savings in the banks and the low deposits in the banks. Now coming to the AMU question. So you have a lot of debates in the newspapers these days. Is Aligarh Muslim University and Jamia Milia, they have to retain their minority status or not? Now, this in, uh, universities get their minority status from Article 30, sub clause 1. So, what it states is um, any linguistic or religious minority can establish a minority educational institution of their choice. So, this word choice is important. So institution of choice, it means a school, a college, or an university. That's what is, uh, can be interpreted. 
So, it was clearly stated in the Kerala Education Bill case. The most important word in Article 30 sub clause 1 is the choice. And the second is National Commission for Minority Educational Institutions Act. It was passed in 2004 and later it was amended in 2010. So what this act, uh, when it was amended in 2010, it clearly said that it has clearly removed uh, exception of the universities to be the minority educational institutions. Initially, the minority educational institutions um, was restricted to the schools and colleges and explicitly said not to the universities. In 2010, in amendment, uh, it has said it has removed except the universities clause. And next time. Um, Later in TMA Pi case, the Supreme Court has clearly stated that um, the education here means either it is primary education, secondary or university education till the PG level. So from these constitutional interpretations and judgments of the Supreme Court, it can be clearly stated that Aligarh Muslim University can be an institution of or can be a stand as a minority institution. And Band-Aid solutions, Indian agriculture needs less regulation. If you talk about the fertilizers, if you talk about the support prices, if everything is observed, Indian agricultural sector is over-regulated. So the market, if it drives the agriculture sector, so the profitability of the farmers increase. But however, I don't agree with this argument. So if you observe, already the Indian agriculture is in distress. If it is open for the market forces, probably the distress and exploitation of the soil, etc. can increase. Now coming to the LPG scheme, that is Ujwala scheme, the Prime Minister Ujwala Yojana. So under this, the BPL families will be provided with 5 crore of LPG connections by 2020. So the give up campaign which has led to the 1 crore plus population giving up their LPG subsidies has provided for the financial support to this particular program. Under this all the BPL families will get a, 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 a free connection uh, and the security deposit everything will be paid by the government for that purpose. And also they get a EMI option for uh, getting the cylinders refilled. Now the major challenge here as per the previous articles is establishing the distribution channels and making the uh, cylinders available for them. So what is option suggested is instead of such a big cylinder, the small cylinders can be supplied to them which cost less so that these people will be incentivized to uh, take up this uh, cylinders. Now coming to the arms scandals, if you see the Beauforts, Tatra truck scam, HW scandal, Barak missile scandal, everywhere one thing is evident. The CBI failed to prove the case and convict the people. What might be the reason? These scandals involve many offshore entities and a complex financial mechanisms to transfer the bribes. And second is, most of the political corruption occurs in the defense sector. So the political patronage and complexity of the offshore dealings, these are the reasons for a failure of the CBI to convict the offenders in these cases. Now, the sledging in trade talks. Now, recently, Hindu published an article where the members of RCEP saying India as obstructionist. The Commerce Minister clearly has said that either with European Union or when it is negotiating with Australia, they consider India as obstructionist. It is because India is trying to push its interests in the services sector. What India is asking in these negotiations in free trade agreements and in RCEP is this. India wants the free movement of the skilled labor across the borders. So it means our people will get more work opportunities outside India. So India has given many concessions on the goods side and India is expecting this. And other countries are fearful that Indian workers will replace the domestic labor over there which can hit their employment prospects. So in this case, the calling India as obstructionist, which has given open space from its side, is itself is a wrong term. Now coming to uh, Iran, 
India has off, I mean, now Indian Prime Minister is visiting Iran next month. And in this case, $6.5 billion India is due to Iran because of the American sanctions which were present before. Now, as the Iran nuclear deal went through and American sanctions are lifted, it means that India has to pay back that. So, before Prime Minister's visit, India wants to pay back that $6.5 billion. Now, the second thing is... Previously, India used to pay half the imports in rupees and the remaining half in uh, euros. Now, India, that particular opportunity has been cancelled and added to that previously, Iran used to deliver uh, oil without any uh, delivery charges. But now, the, all these offers which were there are been scrapped because the competition for the Iranian oil in the international market has increased. Now, coming to the bad loans. The Public Accounts Committee, it has asked the Raghuram Rajan for the reasons of the bad loans for public sector enterprises. The question specifically is, when private sector banks and foreign banks, when they have low NPAs, around 2.2%, why the public sector banks have the 5.98% of uh, uh, non-performance assets? Now, the um, Raghuram Rajan has he highlighted uh, the various factors over here, these are such as um, a lack of proper assessment um, and corruption and uh, lack of the skills with regard to the project assessments. Uh, all these things are given as the reasons by the Raghuram Rajan. Now coming to foreign donors list. Now the two organizations, especially the evangelist organizations, um, one is Compassion International, World Peace, the Family Federation for World Peace and Unification. So these are two kept on the prior permission category. It means that when these organizations, uh, if they are supposed to enter in, you know, send the donations to India, then they have to t uh, take the permission of the Ministry of Home Affairs, and then only they can be send that, uh, they can send that law transfers to India. So these are the articles for today. Thank you very much. All the best.